Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Boardswell's Coffee Chat. I am Sabrina Hannum, the CEO of Boardswell, and we are privileged to share topics that we share with our community that we can get to share with our general populace from time to time. And one of those topics is proxy season 2023. Today, we will demystify proxy season 2023. We'll gain practical insight on what corporate directors need to know about how board boards can navigate this year's uh, proxy season, and then gain practical insight on how best to guide the proxy season 2023 from the board's perspective. As I mentioned, I am Sabrina Hannum, the CEO of Boardswell. We're the match app for boards, and I develop proactive uh, ESG strategies to ensure compliance that mandates and head off activist shareholder issues that uh, ensures alignment uh, with the company's mission and vision. Today, I'm joined by esteemed panelists, Joanna Massey and Brenda Freeman, who will uh, introduce themselves. So please, ladies, uh, Brenda, if you'd like to go first and enjoy uh, and, and introduce yourself. Sure. Hi. Thank you very much, Sabrina. And hello. Thanks for uh, inviting me to be a part of the session. So my name is Brenda Freeman, and um, I've been a public board director since uh, 2013, um, mostly uh, consumer facing boards, but uh, some B2B, B2C, B2B to C um, over the years, um, small private companies that have recently, um, you know, gone public via SPAC to 100 year old companies that, uh, you know, are well established. And so I've had a um, array of experience. I think the thing that got me to boards was uh, a 30 year career um, for the most part, spent at the intersection of technology, um, brands, and culture. So happy to be here. Thanks, Brenda. And Joanna. Hi, Dr. Joanna Massey, and uh, I serve on both private and public company boards, and whether it's micro cap, mid cap, large cap, I bring, I help it attract institutional investors, grow market share, and I do that by um, helping the board focus on change management, navigating risk, um, and navigating change actually specifically around environmental climate issues, social and social issues and governance. And I got to boards through my career in corporate communications, mostly almost entirely at Fortune 500 companies in the media sector, but also technology it was on the intersection of media and technology. So I spent a lot of time in crisis comms, brand reputation management, change management, M&A, the whole thing. So it really, it gives me that nice governance eye, co corporate social responsibility eye and, and ability to uh, advise the C-suite and the officers of the company. Thank you. We're excited for an engaging discussion today. But we'll just, we'll start by demystifying the proxy season process. So for those of us with varying proximity to this experience, Joanna, would you kick us off by demystifying the proxy season process? Why is proxy season important? What is it anyway? Sure. So the primer is that state laws require public companies to hold a shareholder meeting every single year. And the majority of those meetings, which is called the annual general meeting or the AGM, happens in the spring because they're supposed to occur a couple of months after you close the fiscal year. And 80% of publicly held companies have a fiscal year close that coincides with the end of the calendar year. Some of them are off calendar, but the majority of them are on, which is why spring is AGM season, which then makes it proxy season. And the SEC, which, which governs publicly held companies, requires that these companies file what's called proxy statements. And they have to do it ahead of the shareholder meeting. And the proxy statement basically provides details about you know, the various issues that the shareholders are going to vote on during the AGM. And the type of issues that you see during a proxy season traditionally were electing board members, approving the outside auditor, uh, voting on now, voting on executive compensation, which is called say on pay. That's a new one. Uh, and you vote on proposals. There's a variety of proposals that put get put forward by other shareholders. And so everybody votes on that as well. Thanks so much, Joanna. If I could add a little tiny bit of color to that one in that um, I, I actually chair um, several non-gov committees and just over time recently, just the amount of 
oversight and the amount of risk management in general has has just exploded, I would say, right? You know, traditionally, NomGov was more of the, just the traditional governance, as you alluded to, you know, Joanna, that it was more of the, those things that needed to be checked in terms of, you know, checking the box of things to make sure that um, policies and procedures and charters and all those sorts of things were up to date. But now it's much more vibrant, uh, you know, in terms of the issues that are um, just sort of impacting, you know, companies and the fact that shareholders, um, you know, feel much more entitled to demand transparency and things like that of the board. So the stakes have definitely, um, you know, really ratcheted up, particularly when it comes to proxy season responsibilities for board directors. Yeah, that's sure. absolutely true. Go ahead, Joanna. Oh, just no, I'm just agreeing with, with Brenda. She's absolutely right. Yes, it's I so chair NomGov also. So I, yeah, I mean, she, she, I couldn't have said it better. It was very good. She's right. Sorry, I don't chair NomGov. I sit on NomGov and I see that definitely the responsibilities have been augmented. And so there's so much more to get done in this season, especially. So we'll shift to how proxy seasons is, has changed. So that gives us a good segue into that. And you know, I'll start by talking about the shareholder proposals, and then you know we can uh, jump in with other uh, ideas. What we saw in proxy season 2022 was a significant inc significant increase in the shareholder proposals that went to vote. So we had a record number of 941 proposals submitted, and then there were about 562 that actual uh, proposals proceeding to vote. So there was an overall increase in submission that was driven by ESG proposals. There was an increase with that. Looking ahead to the 2023 proxy season, companies should be mindful that while institutional investors were less supportive of the more prescriptive ESG shareholder proposals in 2022, there's still significant institutional support for enhanced reporting and transparency, which may lead to additional activism especially if the SEC's climate change proposal is delayed or faces uh, significant litigation headwinds. Also, ISS and Glass-Lewis have both increased their standards for climate change accountability for the 2020, 2023 proxy season. It will be important for companies to monitor what shareholders and proxy advisory firms are signaling and emphasize engagement, you know, given the greater likelihood that ESG related proposals will make it to vote. Uh, Joanna, would you want to give us an overview of how proxy season have changed? Of course, Brenda, weigh in as well for 2022 and 2023. Yeah, I'm happy to just do the baseline and Brenda can ch chirp in with all sorts of great stories, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but to your point, you know, in 2022, what we saw was climate change, DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion, uh, there was uh, proposals about lobbying and political contributions. Severance agreements became a big thing recently. And this one, uh, non-disclosure clauses in harassment and discrimination settlements, which came out of the Me Too movement, right? So you, we're starting to see how it's reflecting in the board. So that, and, and also we saw a push towards, I think we saw a push towards independent chairman because in the United States, we still allow the CEO chairman combo. And that's actually, it's illegal in the UK and in other parts of the world world. So we saw a push in the U.S. toward independent chairman. And I think in 23, we're going to see more of that because, as you said, more transparency. That's what the shareholders are demanding these days. Um, but I think the big hot and bust button issues, and I know Brenda can talk in detail about this, pay versus performance, right? Last, we have say on pay now, which is basically where the shareholders vote on officer compensation, specifically CEO comp, but pay versus performance was adopted in August of last year of 22. And it mandates that companies make it clear how the executive remuneration is tied to performance and what metrics actually drove the CEO and other officers pay. So a lot more transparency and clarity around that. You also have universal proxy cards, and honestly, should have mentioned that one first because that's the big thing that everyone's talking about, at least what I'm hearing. Um, it's a switch from the way voters used to vote for boards. So um, the new rule went into effect also in August of last year, and we'll, we'll see the full impact of it, I think, this year. And But essentially, you used to have two different cards, which was the board members that the, that the company was putting forward, the board was putting forward, and then you had the 
I'm afraid my cat's behind me right now. Is he? Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I can hear wrestling behind me and I'm worried about what you all are seeing, but I'm just going to keep going because that's a, you know, work from home fail. <laughs> so, anyway, um, but, but so the universal proxy card means that now an activist shareholder who wants to be put up to be on the board will appear on the same voting card as the board members that the that the company's putting forth. And it could dramatically change the game. And then also clawback rules, which were uh, enacted in October of 22. And that involves, you know, whenever you have to restate earnings, if a company has to restate earnings due to a material non-compliance, so it has to be material non-compliance, that means that the company will be able to get back bonuses, get back salaries, get back anything paid out to officers based on faulty financials. And that one's, I think that one's a big one that we could see some, you know, big issues come out of that. Um, so anyway, but I'd love to hear Brenda's details yeah. on that. I mean, I, I I literally was was getting the chills down my spine and sitting a little, uh, you know, straighter because of uh, all of the uh, the rules and um, issues that have have come forth that um, Joanna spoke about, be, and and I've actually experienced um, a few of them, um, including uh, the SEC getting very involved in the say on pay, particularly mm -hmm. the the tie to uh, this new ruling with the clawback. Um, we actually for a company that I won't actually disclose who the what the which company, but uh, we had a whistleblower actually who um, basically had spoken about a concern, um, you know, specifically around a metric, um, and uh, it was one of those things where management did not necessarily think it was that big of a deal. Uh, but as the board, we realized that we needed to be incredibly conservative and transparent. Um, and so we did an investigation and SEC um, sort of on our own independently. We did an, an investigation with outside counsel. And long story short, it ended up being a much bigger deal um, because of the fact that there was, uh, you know, some level of um um, you know, concern, I guess, in terms of what the metrics were, um, how they were defined, were they defined as a as an industry standard or was there some new definition? So, um, you know, I would just say in general and particularly for smaller, newer companies that um, have gone public via SPAC right now are very much under the radar, uh, you know, with SEC um, in terms of, you know, as, as you as most of you all on this call probably know since you're all board directors that a lot of these SPAC, uh, you know, companies have not actually performed. Um, that, uh, you know, they they have not been uh, performing since they've gone public. And so it's requiring, uh, let's say, a number of shareholders that want to know a lot more about the disclosures um, and the metrics that are being, you know, that were, uh, you know, sort of promised. And now that the company um, is public, are they actually performing against those, um, you know, expectations that were that were put forward when, uh, you know, when they did their first initial offering. And so, uh, you know, just the idea of risk management um, and really, really super tight governance um, for companies that are young, you know, board directors is the very first time that you're creating a charter um, and, um, you know, making sure that that first draft, that first version of the charter is inclusive enough. A lot of times it it takes a quarter or two or maybe a few years to realize that, oh, this charter probably is not all inclusive or the charter needs to be relooked at because of the fact that new rulings have, you know, have come about like the universal proxy, uh, you know, ruling. So charters now have to say, uh, you know, for NomGov, as it relates to the annual meeting and, um, you know, putting rosters out there for board directors. It's not business as usual. You do have to change the wording so that uh, you are allowing for, uh, you know, um, um, candidates that could come from the shareholder community. So there's there's just a lot, <laughs> you know, that's going on. I, think. I feel like what you just said too is the, the, the expansion. We could spend a whole hour talking about like what committee does what these days, right? Yeah. Because the thing that we're not touching on and it, because it's too early is the SEC rule change proposals that haven't gone into effect yet, right? So we're talking about climate change reporting and um, 
also diversity on boards and, and um, disclosures around board diversity, and then also disclosure around cybersecurity expertise of your directors. And all of that is coming down the pipeline. We just aren't sure what shape it'll take yet. Yeah, but exactly. we're having discussions like, does that go to audit because it's risk? Does it go to nomgov because everything's falling under nomgov right. right now? I feel like nomgov has taken on this whole <laughs> new, it's true, massive nomgov and audit. Right? It's sort of like everything gets stuffed into those two. I mean, and I actually have two two boards right now that just recently, within the last eighteen months, created a technology committee. Um, for that reason, it's like uh, okay, there was too much already in audit. Um, and, um, and so the idea of making sure that we had cyber, um, you know, cyber risk and making sure that you have board members, you know, members or representation or training for the existing boards, uh, with organizations like an ACD, uh, you know, to make sure that you're able to get, um, uh, you know, uh, keep keep board members up to speed on what the latest issues are, because as you all know, most of the boards are made up of, uh, you know, a composition of some board members who are still in the game, you know, so to speak, that have full time jobs. But then there's quite a few, you know, board directors who have retired. Um, and um, it's been a minute. Uh, you know, since they've actually been in active roles. And so this idea of, of engagement, board director, uh, literacy, and things like that are just even more important as well. So a little plug for board swell. <laughs> for Thank our, you. I, I appreciate it. Services. <laughs> we appreciate the modern uh, executive <laughs> development as well as board training. And because it's so important and board dynamics, so very important, as you mentioned, Brenda, sometimes you have uh, various uh, executives from different companies or they're retired. So how much time do they really spend with each other? They, you know, do they spend time outside of the quarterly uh, meetings? And so in terms of, you know, getting that, th that cadence to become more regular and getting them to have that synergy requires training, uh, especially as rules are changing and what's top of mind. So yes, Boardswell can and are happy to assist with that. You'd mentioned the board committee charters and just to sum up, it's just, you know, reviewing each of the board committee charters to ensure that they're appropriately allocate responsibility among the, among the board committees for cybersecurity, information security, climate and sustainability, human capital. What is where I believe we often default is say, okay, let's give it to audit. And then, but I think if you give it to audit, then audit can delegate and say, okay, well, let's create a new committee. And so there, that's usually the committee that gets everything. And so just like you'd mentioned, and I also believe the corporate governance guidelines. So reviewing those corporate guidelines to assess that they're aligning with these new changes around board diversity, risk management, board oversight. Again, I think that's incredibly important as well. So as we start to think about what are some of the other uh, issues that are coming up during proxy season, do you, is there anything else that you'd like to add that they, people need to know that should be top of mind right now? Um, I'd add one thing, particularly if the company is, um, you know, based in in California. I mean, and and maybe you know, Joanna, you could actually cite. I don't I don't know the specifics of the ruling um, specifically around, uh, you know, representation of women on boards. Uh, that was a big one uh, that uh, I think is still being debated. But I know a number of companies tried to get ahead of that wave um, and. Um, you know, started really looking hard at uh, their current board composition. And if they didn't have a fair number of representation of women or people of color um, or even certain functional expertise, I just think the proactive management of board composition became much more of a thing. Um, I know my door started ringing, my phone started ringing a lot more where there were additional board directors that were being added uh, you know, as opposed to waiting for a board director to roll off, um, you know, I actually joined um, two boards um, that were um, really trying to refresh and expand their board, um, because we know that sometimes it's, you know, these board seats don't necessarily come available very often. It's like you can sit on a seat until a retirement um, for a lot of board charters, um, which is usually well in the 70s, right? Um, and so how are you able to refresh with functional expertise and, and representation of, of women unless, you know, perhaps you do some 
you know, some more um, aggressive planning in terms of expanding, um, you know, board director seats. So I would say board composition um, in general tends to be a really um, big one that's manifesting itself um, a lot, depending on the industry, technology, the technology industries is where I've been, you know, probably most active um, over the last probably five years or so. And most of them have been, you know, pretty aggressive, I think, in terms of recruiting women um, on boards. The numbers have gone up. They're still not nearly what they should be, but we have we are starting to see some impact there. And I think that's where we see the Nom and Gov committee become even more important because now you're looking at this uh, skills matrix and experience matrix to see, you know, where is the company headed? We'd mentioned financial literacy, capital allocation, risk, risk management. So it definitely starts with the Nom and Gov committee to to see this. How do we put this as, you know, as on our task calendar, just use this as a tool. I see a lot of private equity firms that take this very seriously. They're thinking about how are we going to build out our uh skills matrix and our board, but the boards have to lead by example, right? So we have to, you know, lead the organization by example, and then, you know, let that flow down also within the organization where talent in the organization is important. We see that as like a top trend in a Harvard study for 2023, that talent is just a top talent. And I think around board succession, right? So how are we thinking about what our board succession planning and creating real, uh, real objectives and KPIs around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, actually board performance, I think is, is no longer just an automatic, uh, you know, stamp of yes, you, you get to, to continue to sit on the board until retirement. Like I don't, I, I feel like the, the winds have changed pretty significantly as it relates to that. Um, uh, you know, there's outside, um, um, you know, council that actually can, um, that actually conduct board evaluations. Um, I have that now with a couple of companies, um, where board directors actually rate themselves, but they also rate, uh, you know, their, their other board directors. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a, a, a spectrum, I think, of, um, ways of getting at board performance, um, um, you know, just making sure that we're a high performing, uh, you know, board, I think as NOMGov uh, leaders or, or representatives of that committee, it becomes even more important. Okay, thank you for your insights. And we'd like to, as we're closing, think about, so at the end of the day, what are the best ways that board members can help guide proxy season 2023? If you were to give them if a guidance and final words, key takeaways, what would you uh, say? You, you, these are things that you must and, and, and need for, for proxy season 2023. Um, I'd say uh, I'll, I'll start. I'll say that overall, I think the best defense in any proxy battle with an activist investor is, uh, is performance and stock price. Right. That's how you're going to get the rest of the investors to vote along with what the board wants as opposed to what the activist wants. And keep in mind, you know, investors can bring up issues. That's their job. I mean, after all, it's their money, right, that they're investing in the company. So boards have a better chance of winning those votes or, you know, having the activist agenda voted down if that's what's wanted. You know, sometimes the boards embrace the activist agenda, but if, if the desire is to have it voted down, when you can point to solid performance and a good stock price, and I'll add to that when you're being transparent, right? That's, that's in my experience, the best way to come out of a proxy fight, you know, getting what you, what the board thinks is best for the company. Oh, I, I think that's great. I totally um, agree with what Joanne said there. But, and, and then in addition, I would say um, with performance comes the support of the ratings uh, organizations, Glass Lewis and, um, and um, oh God, I just blanked. <laughs> ISS, ISS. ISS, thank you, um, that they will tend to support if it comes down to a vote in general. I think historically they side with, uh, you know, with management of the company if there is, um, you know, proof points of, of performance. Um, the other thing that I think, you know, because I think management might roll their eyes a little to say, well, just drive the stock price and perform and we won't have any activist issues. But, you know, they have to do their part. But then as the board members, you know, we have to do our part, too, which is making sure we're ready, you know, which is really sort of evaluating ourselves, uh, having outside uh, you know, advisors, you know, perhaps take a look and say, where are we weakest? Is our tenure, you know, do we not have enough uh, 
um, you know, refreshment coming in? Um, do we not have the right sort of composition of the board? Do we not have the right functional expertise? Do we have, like, I have a board director who's missed too many meetings, you know, it's like, oh boy, guess what? I'm going to have to have a tough conversation with this board director. And maybe 10 years ago, we might not have decided to have that tough conversation. So, you know, just sort of making sure that, um, you know, that, that our, we have good uh, board hygiene, <laughs> you know, I think is the other um, aspect of how to be prepared for uh, the 2023 proxy season. Yes, I definitely think, you know, activists are one among many shareholders. So having good hygiene will help you to ward off uh, the uh, that type of um, activism, as well as, as mentioned, the, you know, institutional investor and proxy advisory guidelines. So ensuring that those policy changes that have been released, like we're considering those when we are focusing on proxy season 2023. This has been I do want to if I can stick in something about activist investor though, because you just said something. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. But like I think we have a lot of times we have a traditional idea of activist investors, the Carl Icons of the world, the big fishes, you know, with a lot of money. Universal proxy card is changing that. And 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 so is I, I mean, an activist investor can be a small shareholder who makes a lot of noise, which is completely possible today on social media. That's right. By the way, that's happening on LinkedIn now. They will DM directly directors. Um, we, I have had that actually. So to your point, retail investors are getting in the game now too. They themselves can be activists. It doesn't have to be the big boys. You're right. right. <laughs> so you, you focus on your particular company and what you're in, in your hygiene, as opposed to you have all of this noise, right? So you're one among many investors. So just stay, keep your eyes on the prize. Well, we had a great, uh, discussion and on, and giving us, thank you for providing some footprints on how to get into a uh, proxy season, 2023. We imagine that this spring is going to be very, uh, enlightening and thank you for all that you do on boards and hello, hello to your beautiful cat. <laughs> <laughs> Let's play spot the cat. Right. Where are we during the session? I'm so sorry about that. No, no, this is, we're in a virtual environment. So we are, we appreciate families and cats and, you know, your coworker. <laughs> yes, he's my coworker. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, ha thank you so much and have mm -hmm. a great day. And thank you for, to our audience for engaging with us today. Thank you. Thank you.